And this morning we're going to read from verse 18 to 24. So Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up, in, up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you reach out to sinners like us with the best news there is and the greatest love there is. And Lord, we pray that we'd receive it, all of it, as much as we can. Help us to believe this. Help us to understand it. Help us to apply it. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I had a conversation with a guy a few months back. Um, who was bad-mouthing Billy Graham, of all people. Uh, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, shortly after um, Billy Graham passed away, um, his complaints were political. Um, the way he saw it, the, the things that Billy Graham preached um, were political because they were moral. And so he had a hard time with that. And, and I told him that Billy Graham was... Uh, a very loving person because he spent his life telling people how much God loves them and how they can have a relationship with God and how they can be rescued from their sin. And since the guy wasn't a Christian, I did my best to try not to use Christianese, you know, words that are jargon that we know, but people don't. And, and I tried hard to do that. And, but just to say it as plainly as I could and and I, I also tried to use the word we a lot so that I wasn't pointing the finger because those are good things to do when you're trying to share Jesus with people. And when I was finished saying what I had to say, he was so enraged. He, he began to uh, go off on me about how he did not need to be saved from anything. And if I need to be saved, that's my problem and, and all these types of things. And, and sadly, that's how it ended. And I thought about it a lot, and I think about that guy. I don't know him very well, um, but I pray for him. But he couldn't have been more wrong. You know, he couldn't have been more wrong about his situation. Um, he desperately needs to be saved. All of us desperately need to be saved. And in our passage this morning, starting there at verse 18, all the way to chapter 3, verse 20, the Apostle Paul is going to tell us why. And, and through that section, he makes... Uh, an undeniable case, perfect within logic and reasoning and sound biblically, that every last one of us is sinful and in desperate need of saving. And, and so we're going to dig in and discover he's, he's unpacking verses 16 and 17, which we studied last time, about why we need this gospel of salvation. And so verse 18 again. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So right away, the Apostle Paul tells us what we need saving from. He doesn't beat around the bush. He mentions two things. He mentions the wrath of God, and he, re he mentions the rebellion of man. Um, I called, uh, I'm calling ungodliness and unrighteousness the rebellion of man and so the apostle paul tells us that the wrath of god is revealed from heaven and and so first question what's the wrath of god and and it's the anger of god it's his displeasure it's his indignation and it it's 
wrath. And, and here Paul tells us that that wrath is revealed from heaven. And God has a, a real anger. God has a real anger, and God has an active anger, and it's an, a moving anger from heaven to act. And that ought to be something that we should be very interested in. Imagine if you were sitting somewhere in a restaurant, somewhere at a store, and some big, powerful, scary guy walks in, and you can tell right away from his body language and the look on his face and the speed at which he's moving that he's mad. One of the first things you'd want to know because he's big and powerful is, whoa, who's he mad at and why is he mad? And I hope it's not me because he's big and strong and you, you can just know from it that, man, what's, what's going on here? You'd want to know that. You'd pay attention to the angry man. And, and that's something that we'd be concerned about in that setting. How much more should we be concerned to know what makes God mad? What's he angry about? And and what is it that moves God in heaven to express wrath? And, and how does he express wrath? And am I part of that? And those are things we would, we would think that we would want to know. And, and Paul tells us here, he, he answers those questions in this passage. And typically when we think of the wrath of God, I think a lot of times we think future. We think, you know, something that's going to happen down the road. We read about it in scripture when God's going to pour out judgment on the world and and that will happen. The Bible teaches it clearly and, and plainly. But that's not the only wrath that God has and expresses. That's not the only way that wrath is going to be revealed. The verse says that the wrath of God is revealed. And the idea is his wrath is present. It, it can be clearly seen right now. And his anger is expressed right now. And, and it's expressed, it says, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That's what God is angry about. That's what his wrath is aimed at and, and stirred up by. Ungodliness and unrighteousness. And it says all of it. it uh, we can get fooled or twisted into the idea that God only hates sin that's worse than our sin. And it's easy to find sin that's worse than our sin. Just read the news. I mean, it's not hard to see it. You know, really bad people, way worse than us, criminals, people like this, you know, and, or that he only hates the sin of, you know, non-religious people or people who don't go to church. He only hates people's sins like that. Once you go to church, he doesn't hate your sin anymore or something like that. And, but it says here all ungodliness. It says all unrighteousness of mankind. And it, just a simple definition of what those words mean ungodliness would be mistreatment of or even just simple disregard of God and and uh, later on in the in uh, chapter 3 he's going to talk about how uh, no one seeks God so we're all of us have are ungodly and then unrighteousness would be disregard or mistreatment of our fellow man our fellow other people and and God hates and is angry at that he, he doesn't like that, any of that in, in us. His wrath is aroused by it, and it's aimed at it. Or to put it more simply, God hates sin. And he doesn't just hate other sins, he hates all sin. He hates it. And, and the next question then is why? And we, we can understand why he would hate some sins, why he would hate certain sins. All of us probably have a degree of that in us where we, there are certain sins that we just can't stand. And it's usually other people's. <laughs> but but wh why does he hate all of it? Why not just the really excessive stuff? Why all of it? And the next phrase says that, says the reason why. Because in sin we suppress the truth. We suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And, and the Greek word that's translated suppress here means, literally means to hold. And the idea is to, to hold back or to hold captive or to restrain. And, and mankind is imprisoning the truth through our sinfulness. What truth? The truth. The truth about God. The truth about the nature of this world. The truth about ourselves. Unrighteousness is holding that back. It's imprisoning the truth. It's burying it. It's hiding it. And God's not happy about that. He's angry about that. You know, many people bring up 
you know, the evil in the world and they'll bring it up, you know, we bring it up for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons people bring up the evil in the world is because it's often presented as an argument against the God of the Bible, that the God that we believe in. And people will point out to evil in the world with implying usually one of a couple of things. Either they'll imply that all the evil in the world proves, it, proves there's no God, or they'll point out that the evil in the world proves that if he does exist, he's either not good or he's not as powerful as you guys say he is. But our passage here says something altogether different. It says there is a God, he is great, but mankind in rebellion and in sin has buried the truth of that, has distorted that in sin and marred that truth and hidden that truth and twisted that truth. Think of it like this. Let's say some master artist makes some great painting and it's beautiful and it's detailed and it's awesome and, and then someone comes along and scribbles on it, you know, like crayon marks all over it. Or maybe they get a spray paint and they, you know, tag on it or something like that and, they, and, and so now to look at it, or maybe they drew little mustaches on the faces and just different things that they, somebody might do. Some creep might do something like that. And so now to look at this art, it's not the same as it was. It has some semblance of what it was, but it's not the same anymore. And, and it's distorted. And the truth of what it was made to be is kind of hidden, kind of there, kind of hidden. And, and how's that artist going to feel about that? He's not going to be happy. He's going to be fired up about that. And then imagine if someone saw the painting now in its distorted state and with, in marred like that, and then, and then they wondered at the artist. Well, I thought this guy was supposed to be a good artist. It doesn't look very good to me. I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, it's kind of good, but, but look how messed up it, uh, it is. It doesn't look like an artist. It looks like something a third grader made. And, and well, what's, how's the artist going to feel about that? He's going to be even more mad. He's going to be that he was misrepresented because that's not a, that's not true. That's a lie. He's a good artist. Someone else ruined it. And and but the the damage is done and now it holds back that truth. And God made this world. He's the artist here. He he made us and he made all of it good in, in uh, Genesis after the end of each day of creation. It says God saw it and said it was good. And, and we're a part of that creation. We're a part of that art. And not only uh, just how we're made, but even our lives are meant to be part of that. We're, we're made in his image. We're to be like him. And, and every time we sin, it's like we scribbled all over his work. It's like we tweaked it and distorted it and, and, and made others look at it and say, well, if, if there really is a God, he hasn't done a very good job. And, and there's lots of examples of how that works in real life. Here's one example. You hear this today. The high rate of divorce. You hear this, and then you hear people take that and go, well, what good is marriage? Marriage isn't very good. I mean, look at all the divorce that's happening. And God made marriage, and it's good. It's good. We're the ones that messed it up. God didn't mess it up. And so he's angry. His wrath is aroused at that and aimed at our sin. Somebody said it this way. Sin isn't bad because God hates it. God hates it because it's bad. And, and how important it is for us to have an accurate understanding about sin so that not only will we know that God hates it, but that we'll hate it too, and then we'll see our great need for his salvation. Verse 19. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that we are without excuse. So here now the Apostle Paul begins to elaborate on how, how it is that sinfulness and, our, and sinful people bury the truth. And specifically, 
the first part of that truth that there's an awesome God. And, and so we see more reason for his anger and his wrath, why, why he's so angry about it. Take, ta taking again our illustration of the um, artist's work being marred, imagine that the vandal who did that uh, didn't just do this accidentally. It wasn't an accidental kind of thing that they distorted the, the painting. They did it on purpose. They knew there was a painter. They knew, they knew that his, this was his work, but they distorted it anyway. And, and Paul points out that mankind doesn't, we don't just sin accidentally. It's not without knowing, like, oh, we didn't know. Look what he says, says, what may be known of God is manifest in them because God has shown it to them. In other words, people begin with enough information about God to know better, to some degree to know better. And that's been true since the very first people, since Adam and Eve, from all, all the way down until now. I, I had a thought about those guys, Adam and Eve, and everybody that lived up until the flood. Something interesting to think about. Genesis chapter 5 shows us that Lamech, who was uh, Noah's father, was 50 years old. You just got to do the math when you read the chapter. He was 50 years old before Adam died. He was 50 years old before Adam died. And, and, and so for his, the first 50 years of Noah's dad's life, Adam was still around. He was still there. People still had access to, to the guy who lived in the garden and walked in the cool of the garden with God in the cool of the day. He, the guy was still around that long. And, and Noah and his generation were able to hear firsthand and then only secondhand about that, about God, that he's real and he was, you know, and there he was and he made everything. And so... Now, for them, what could be known about God was clearly made known to the world that sinned so bad that God said, I'm flooding this thing and starting over. Now, now even though that's a powerful thought in and of itself, that's not even the argument that the Apostle Paul uses. That's not what he brings up as, you know, you should know better. He has a different argument that we should know better. He doesn't say what may be known of God was manifest to the earliest people on earth, but not us now. He says that what may be known is manifest to them, that would be everybody, and, and, and that he's currently showing that. How does God do that? When, when does God do that? It says, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. And so since, since creation, God has displayed that he exists. His, he's displayed his divine existence and his amazing power. And, and we can look out at creation we can look around, we can look up to the heavens and, and um, all its beauty, all its orderliness, how huge it is, how detailed it is, and we can know there's a God. Man, he's amazing. He's powerful. Look at it all. Psalm 19 says the same thing. Verses 1 to 4 say, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There's no speech nor language where the voice isn't heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. And so God has put a loudspeaker on in creation that's been playing the same message since the first people walked this earth. And, 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 and it, this message is beyond all language barriers, all cultures, all times. It continues to play and constantly declaring, you live in the world of an amazing creator, an, um, an awesome God, a powerful God. In fact, you are part of his creation. He's here 
He's speaking, he's real, he's powerful. Here's a different type of illustration. We had art, we'll do science now. When they investigate crimes, you know, they want to know certain things. One of the ways they do that is they, they, they look for, you know, hints or evidences that somebody was there and who that person might have been. So they find things like, you know, it's pretty sophisticated what they can do nowadays, so be good. Hair follicles, you know, fingerprints, DNA, that kind of stuff. It's, it's amazing. They can tell if someone was there. And they can, you know, they, they can tell certain things about that. I, I don't know if I'm right on this, but I think they can sometimes tell, you know, I, I might be wrong, gender even by the smallest amount of things, uh, that kind of stuff. And they collect the data, the evidence, they analyze it, and they determine some things. They don't determine everything. But they determine a good amount of stuff just by the, these things. And, and the apostle Paul says, the world is screaming with data. There's evidence all over the place. And it tells us many things. It, it tells us there's a divine being. It tells us that he's beyond the world that we live in and he made it all and that he's powerful and he loves order and he loves beauty. And, and that data, again, it doesn't tell us everything about him. That's why... Later on, God sent prophets, and he gave us his word, and then ultimately, he sent Jesus to give us the, the most information that we can have. But, but the point is, he gave all this so that no human has any excuse not to know. There's a God, and he's amazing. God, God has not hidden himself. He's making himself known. We live in his world. We live in bodies that he designed. We live in, you know, that he put together in our mother's wombs. Go back to the, the painting again for a second. The damage done may make some question if it's really the art of the master painter, but, but even as they look, they can still kind of see signs that it's their work. Maybe they, they're like, yeah, it's pretty messed up, but right there, there's his signature, like he always puts it right there on that part of the painting. Or I mentioned uh, um, Thomas Kincaid before he would hide little ends all over his paintings. First letter of his wife's name. And you could s maybe somebody goes up and puts a mustache on some of these people, but there's the end, there's his initial. It's still there. And this world is definitely marred from what it was when God first made it. It very much is. But his initials and his fingerprints and his, it's all there still. That it's his handiwork. And, and they're still shouting the same thing. They're still shouting his presence and his glory. Verse 21. Because although they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So even though God made himself knowable, and, and as we said, the data's there, the fingerprints, the initials can be seen. The, the suppression of the truth goes deeper than just some scribble marks or an ugly mustache or, you know, a, a tag on there or something like that. And, and, and we started to say before, it's not an accident either. The Apostle Paul tells us what sinful mankind what sinful people are doing with the data that they have. It says they didn't glorify him as God, nor were they thankful. Based on the number of religions in the world and the number of people that adhere to all those religions, we can easily see the truth of, of the first part. They knew God. You know, people know there's a God. There, most would agree, yeah, there's a God. Sure, he exists. He made everything. Most people have something in their mindset of that. There's some loud atheists out there that for you know, various reasons get a lot of press to make it sound like a lot of people aren't believing in God, but, I, but most people in the world believe in something. And, and that, but that's not the problem. The problem is the next part of the verse. The problem is people know God, but don't glorify him as God. We, we say he's God. We say, yes, there's God. 
but we fail to treat him like he's God. We don't pay him the honor and the respect that is absolutely due to him as God. We don't worship him in the way that he's worthy of and deserving of. We don't obey him in the way that he deserves to be obeyed. And even more basic than that, we're not thankful to him in the way that we ought to be thankful to him. It's not even remotely an exaggeration to say that all that we have and all that we are is his. Not just the meals that we eat, not just on Thanksgiving, but all of it. This is his universe. This is his earth. That's his sunlight. It's his air. It's, we sang it a minute ago, it's your breath in our lungs. And it's his water. Our, it's, he's the one that started our hearts beating. He's the one that gave us brains to think thoughts and look at data and analyze it. And, and, and he deserves thanks for that. Yet in our natural state, our belief of God is often limited to preference. You know, kind of kind of like we have a preference in what sports team we like. We have a preference Coke over Pepsi or whatever. You know, we have these preferences. And a lot of times that's what our that's what we do with the data that there's a God. We know he's there, but we don't treat him like the almighty. And, and often when we do acknowledge him, it's just to issue complaints. I got this complaint. Why isn't God doing that? And he's describing a knowledge of God. Here's what he's describing. He is describing a knowledge of God, but no heart for him. No heart. And imagine someone literally giving you, any way you can take those keys? <laughs> Thanks. Imagine someone literally giving you everything. They, they hook you up with food and a place to live and clothes and even things to enjoy and beauty and on and on. And, and you're, you know, uh, I've had people give us uh, play, a place to stay for a vacation before. It's great. You know, hey, go stay. we have this place. Go stay there. And it's, it's awesome. And imagine that your only response is, yeah, that guy gave me. And that's it. That guy let me stay at his place. And that's all... That's all you did. And then imagine you take it a step further and go, you know that place you let me stay at? How come you didn't make it like this? And how come you didn't provide me that for it? And how come you didn't this and that and the other? I mean, that'd just, just be on rude, right? Just be on rude. And the Apostle Paul, what he's saying here is, this is more than rude. God hates sin because this is also part of the way that we're holding back the truth by failing to honor God the way that he's due and be thankful to him it it, it does more damage than just it's not like it's it's not just we're he, hurting God's ego or his pride I can't even say thank you that's what I would do if I let you stay at a place and you didn't say I that's how I would react but it's more than that with God listen to what it says the reason why he hates that is because here's what the result of that is. It says, they became futile in their thoughts. Thoughts there could be speculations or ideas. And, and the word translated futile is, could be vain or empty. I, I, would, I would paraphrase it this way. That knowing God, but not treating him like, you're, like he's God... This is my paraphrase. I'll never publish a Bible. They became stupid. Every lame idea that I've ever had, and I'm guessing the rest of the human race is true, this is true of them too. Every stupid idea that I've ever come up with was absent honoring God the way that he should be honored, and it was absent being thankful to him the way that I should be thankful to him. Every single one of them. And, and we, we might say more simply, our failure to worship and be thank, thankful to God just makes us dummies. And, and here's the thing about that. It doesn't make us incapable. It doesn't make us unable to do things. It doesn't take away all of our skill and ability. 
And that's why it's even more destructive and dangerous because we, we still have, you know, there's still really smart people like this in a sense. I, just, I know I just called them dumb, but still got, you know, the ability to do things. But now those abilities are tweaked by all kinds of lame ideas. And, and then more than that, more than just our minds, this too, it affects our hearts. Their foolish hearts were darkened. And that would, you know, that's speaking of the inner, inner part of us, the deepest part of us, not just the organ in our lungs that pumps blood, but, but that part of us that wants and feels and desires. There was, God made us with light in that part of us. And we've darkened it. And so the ability to see clearly and the ability to want rightly is gone. I, I, I say it this way. We have a, a, a tweaked out thinker and a broken wanter. Our wanters are broken. And, and, and since um, that's, how, that's how it works, so it affects our emotions, it, it, it affects our desires, and the things that we pursue and the things that we feel like are worth pursuing. In other words, failure to treat God the right way in, in worship and in obedience and thanksgiving makes us do all kinds of things wrong. We don't think right, we don't feel right, we don't want right. And so God's mad about that. That's not how I intended it to be. That's not how I made you to be. And, and so it's, it's, this is far deeper than... Uh, destroying the data this is actually distorting the instrumentation that he's given us to analyze data the data has been messed up our our uh, sensors are messed up having a, a heart for God but or having a knowledge of God but no heart for him might not seem like the worst sin that there could be you know, we could probably talk about lots of other sins that are way worse, you know, like stealing or murder or things like this. But by him painting the picture this way, he's reminding us that sin is, all sin is terrible, all sin is destructive, all sin does this, and God hates all of it. Simply knowing there's a God and agreeing that and making that your preference, I'll, I'm on the non-atheist side of things that's not enough the information that he exists and is powerful is the starting point that would lead us to go man he's amazing and i want to praise him i need to praise him i need to thank him i need to glorify him soap's a good thing everybody agree soap's a good thing you glad we have soap it's nice to know that it exists, isn't it? But knowing it exists won't make you not stink. Got to apply it. I need to apply that soap. And simply knowing about God is it's a good start. But need, we need to apply what we know. And the very first part of application that there's a God is to worship him, to obey him, to thank him. He's worthy of it. And we need it. Verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. The, the downward spiral here into the ugliness of what sin does gets steeper and steeper as we read along. Failure to worship God and be thankful to him is just the beginning of the downwardness into depravity. Imagine if you had a, a deadly condition where one of the symptoms was it made you think the, con the symptoms weren't that bad. Imagine you had, you got a tumor and you, and, and you got this tumor, and one of the effects of having this tumor was that it made you think that, hey, everybody has tumors, so why is a tumor such a big deal? Who cares? No big deal. Or worse, maybe, you, maybe the tumor made you think that tumors are good. You're, it means you're free. And, and 
I th I, there are things that do that, actually. By the way, drugs and alcohol do that. You know, I, I mean, I remember how awesome I thought I was when I would, you know, back in the day, how deep I thought I could get back in the day doing those things. But, but verse 22 tells us that sin actually does something like that. It actually does. Professing to be wise, they became fools. That's one of the effects of sin. It, 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 and it does that, and then it blinds us to the fact that it's doing that. We don't, it limits our understanding without realizing it's limiting our understanding. It limits our understanding while making us think our understanding has expanded. That's what sin does. It, it darkens our hearts to the point where we think our heart, you know, is something we should follow. Follow your heart. And <clears throat> it's not that we don't have thoughts. It's not that we don't have a heart. It's that they're, they're still as active as ever, but totally wrongly aimed. And at this point, and we'll get there next time, we, we haven't reached atheism yet. That comes later. But when someone thinks that their foolishness is wisdom, that's bad. I mean, it should go without saying. Sin doesn't automatically make us renounce knowing God. But the first thing that it does is it really distorts the way we approach him. The futile mind, that darkened heart, makes us think that God is something far less than he actually is. And so people start making all these images of what they think God is like. And, and he describes some of those. And you can see these in history, but they still exist today. He says, he, they, one, of the, one of the things that he, he mentions here is, is uh, like corruptible man. And so you have the Greek gods and the Roman gods. They were human-like, but they had superpowers. So they're like superheroes. And, or then, they, then you had other groups doing, you know, like the Assyrians, they would worship the fish. That's, that's God. And, and, and all these things were an attempt to kind of envision God, even maybe to enhance their worship. If we have something that we can touch and feel and look at, it will enhance the way we worship. And, and every, no, one's, no one's immune from this kind of temptation. Even the children of Israel, when Moses went up on the mountain, they didn't like how long he was taken up there. So Aaron took and made the golden calf. And, and he didn't say, hey, let's worship this thing instead of God. He said, hey, this is our God that saved us. Let's worship him now with this thing here. And, and they worshiped it. And obviously God didn't like that. And he doesn't like that because he's infinitely greater than anything we could come up with or, you know, formulate or say this represents him or anything at all. Anyone ever seen Napoleon Dynamite? There's this one part where in an attempt to impress a girl, he, he drew a picture of her and he gave it to her. And it was horrible. It was so awful. He made it look like she had a mustache, and, but he was so impressed with it. He was super impressed with it, and she just, she was sick to her stomach. She was like, ugh, looking at it. And, and God hates all attempts at us trying to enhance what we think of him through, you know, images and things like this. It, it, he hates it because there's nothing that we could come up with that even remotely comes close. He's greater than anything there is in, in creation, and he's greater than anything that we can imagine. Kind of wonder about that same idea as it relates to a lot of the weirdness that goes through the church and is passed over as worship. You know, where people are doing certain things in church and they're somehow thinking that that enhances worship. Just the different waves of things. I'm, I'll barking and laughing and you know I don't know if I'm stepping over a line here or being too judgmental but like you know needing fog machines and things like that I, I don't know just the thought that this is going to enhance my ability I don't know maybe I went too far this is again why God hates sin though why is wrath is aimed at it because 
we, we set some up to be like, like God and we're actually going down instead of up. And he's like, you're going in the wrong direction. That's not how I, I I'm so much more than that. And, and he hates it. Now up to this point, we've been talking about why God hates sin, why his wrath's aimed at it. And, and, and in our last point, we're gonna look briefly at how God's wrath is revealed, just kind of a preview to next time. But verse 24, the first part there says, therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts. And then if you skip ahead to verse 26, it says, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. And then again to verse 28, kind of in the middle of the verse there, it says, God gave them over to a debased mind. And so you notice the repetition of God gave them. And in the New King James, which I'm reading from it, it says he gave them up and he gave them over. But in the original, it's the same, uh, the same words, and sometimes translators frustrate us, but all three times it's the same. It's God gave them up or God gave them over. In other words, God let people have it their way. And yes, someday in the future, and I think we're close, but someday in the future, God is going to pour out his wrath like great bowls on a Christ-rejecting world. But even now, even right now, his wrath is revealed at this very moment, and this is how it's revealed. He lets people have it their way. And verse 24 begins with the word therefore. So in light of all these things that makes God hate sin, here's what he does. He says, have it your way. Have it your way. And that's a terrible thing. Call it tough love. Call it, you know, learning, letting us learn the hard way. Hard way. But God determines that that's how he's going to express his wrath. And, and it's good. It's actually good. God knows better than us. And so for, if, the, if the only way that he can show that if the only way he can show people, look, you are sinful. You need me. You need to be saved. If the, if the way to do that is by saying, all right, if you don't believe me, try it your way. Do it like that. And what a terrible state it is to get our own way. That's why Jesus taught us to pray, your will be done so that we can get that in our thinking and, and start to mean it. Do I really want everything that I think that I want? We don't. It doesn't take long living in the world to find out how terrible getting everything you want really is. And our hearts can become so dark that we convince ourselves that I, I, want, all, I want all that I want. I don't need the God who made me. I don't want him. And at some point, he, he does in individual lives and in cultures and in nations. He says, all right, here you go. Find out. And you can kind of get that as a parent, you know, how that works. No, you can't eat all your Halloween candy in one sitting. Of course not. And then, and, but imagine if you let them. They're going to be sick. They might not want candy for a while. And they'd vomit it all out. And the scary and sobering thing is that is a lot of times that's the only thing that will get through to us. You know, let us find out how it really goes <clears throat> so that we might really see the terror of it. All of it, all of sin. And then finally get to the place where we go, I really do need God. I really do need God. I really do need to worship him, not just check them off as a box like this is you know I'm, I'm I like this sports team I vote this way and I and God yes too but to worship him and God has great wrath against any sin and all sin for all these reasons and he wants us to hate it too and and to cling to Jesus we can see the wrath of God you can see it and when it says it's revealed you can see it right now you can see it you can see it in families. You can see it in people. You can see it in nations. That it's, 
the sin and they've been given over to it and look at the mess of it all. And, and more than anything else, our great need and the best thing for us is to say, not my will be done, but thy will be done. I, I need you. <clears throat> and so he hates sin and it's an ugly picture that we have of it. I don't want to end on that note. We're going to be studying along these same lines for a couple more weeks. And, and he's, because he's painting the picture of why we need to be saved. And, and it's a terrible picture. So that the good news is, is desirable. But I, we can't, I don't want to wait till we get to the end before we get to any of that. So <clears throat> a little bit of preview. God, as much as God hates the sin, as terrible as it would be to be given over to it, he hates our sin, but he loves us. He, he, he does want to save us from our sin. He doesn't want to give people over. He, and, and we can be saved from our sin. And we can be saved from the wrath of his, of, of his wrath against our sin. And when you trust Jesus as Lord, your sins are forgiven. And his wrath is appeased. And not only that, but that futile thinking is reversed. And that darkened heart becomes enlightened again. And that lame way that we worshiped becomes worshiping in spirit and in truth. That's what it means to be saved. He's, he reverses all that. He rescues us from the, the damage that sin done, does, the anger that he has against it, and the consequences of it all. The ultimate consequences of it all. Jesus didn't make it so that our sin is less heinous. He paid for everything we deserve because of it. Sin's a terrible thing, but the gospel's far, far greater. And, and so trust Jesus and be saved. Look at your sin and... and Turn away from it in your heart and your mind and tell God, I want to be saved. Save me from this. Save me from my sin. Save me from your wrath against it. And to do that, you trust Jesus. Believe, believe that he died for you, that he rose again. Confess with your mouth, your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your heart for sinners, that you're a saving God. Thank you that you make it clear how you feel about sin, but you make it even more clear how you feel about sinners. You love us. And so, Lord, help us to have your attitude in your heart and your mind regarding our own sin and to trust you and be saved. And we. We love you and we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and finish up with one last song.
you and we thank you so much Lord for your word we thank you God for your mercy and your patience with people Lord we thank you God for your holiness and we, we pray Father for a greater and a more elevated view of the holiness of who you are the greatness of who you are your love for mankind your patience with humanity Lord and may we embrace this wonderful salvation that you have offered to us and given to us Lord so thank you Father, we pray your blessings over this congregation. May we walk in your love, in your grace, and in your mercy, Lord. Thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. God bless you.